What is the natural rate of inflation and how should investors be adjusting their portfolios right now? Joining me now is RBA CEO and Chief Investment Officer Richard Bernstein. Uh, Richard, great to have you in studio. Thanks for coming by. Thanks, Jack. Before we start real quick, you manage about $16 billion for individuals, institutions, and you were formerly Chief Investment Strategist for Merrill Lynch. Exactly. All righty. So I want to ask you about Friday's report by the New York Fed, which said that despite all our concerns about inflation, they see inflation returning to a natural state of less than 1%, essentially going, continuing on that downward uh, thing we saw pre-COVID. What's your thoughts on that? Jack, I think that's very optimistic. And the reason why it's optimistic is I'm sure they're assuming, I haven't seen the report, but I'm sure they're assuming that geopolitics stays the way it has been the past five to 10 to 15 years. We all know that geopolitics are changing. We know that globalization is contracting. And what globalization did for the U.S. economy was it constantly increased competition for many, many years, right? And, what comp and we know when you increase competition, you put downward pressure on prices. As globalization contracts, we're probably going to see some upward pressure on prices. Just fewer competitors means higher prices. I would bet the Fed is not accounting for that. And all Fed is not as cheap to manufacture in Indiana as it is in China. Correct. That's exactly right. Uh, another story in the news right now, of course, is the debt ceiling. Mm. Um, and let's hope that we actually solve this problem. But you wrote an interesting note in which you said that even if we avoid default, that doesn't mean it's essentially free for the U.S. economy. Mm. In fact, yes, there's two things. Look, a default is terrible. Right. There has never been a default in, in fixed income history where somebody would say, wow, that's good. <laughs> that has never happened. So, so default is bad no matter how it comes about. But a debt downgrade, meaning that we go from double A to single A or triple A to double A, whatever it is, um, that's not good either. Because what happens is that as your debt is downgraded, you pay higher interest costs. And for those of you who might remember, in 2011, the United States suffered a debt downgrade. From that point, almost to the day, I'm exaggerating only a little bit, almost to the day, the United States started paying 100 to 200 basis points, meaning 1 to 2 percent of extra interest costs on our debt, not just for the government, but that translates through to mortgages, to uh, corporates, to municipalities. Everybody started paying more. So not only do we have to be concerned about a default, we also have to be concerned about a debt downgrade, which many people aren't talking about. And the more and more we push it, the closer, closer that Correct. happens. That's exactly right. Uh, let's pivot to markets. So first of all, um, you've commented on the narrowness of, you know, the, the stock market's been going up, but that's all been relying on just a few stocks. Oh, it, it, it's an amazing thing to watch here. I think this is the narrowest market, meaning the number of stocks that are outperforming is so few. This is the narrowest market we've seen since the tech bubble in 1999 and 2000. I would simply say the implied economic forecast of there's only three or five or 10 companies that are going to grow over the next, uh, you know, whatever time period you want, there's only that few number of companies. That's an amazingly bearish view of the world. I just don't think that people should be that bearish. Whether you're looking at, at the non-tech companies in the United States, whether you're looking overseas, there has to be growth opportunities somewhere. I mean, it's just so incredibly bearish. Well, give us some thoughts on where people might find those. So I think right now, um, you know, if you think about things like energy infrastructure, if you think about utility infrastructure, there's all kinds of things going on there. Real estate is changing away from services towards manufacturing. There's opportunities there as well. Outside the United States, Look, we have big positions in Europe. We have big positions in Japan. There are plenty of opportunities, and those markets are really, really cheap right now. I think it's hard for U.S. investors to get their heads around putting money in Europe or Japan. I mean, Europe is thought of as, as a sclerotic old economy. Yes. Japan has gone nowhere since, what, 1989. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Richard, why do I want to put money there? So I bet one thing your viewers don't know is that in 2022, 70 percent, 70 70 percent of non-U.S. markets outperform the United States. I mean, that's an incredible number. And the fact that people don't know that shows how geographically myopic portfolios have become. And the reason why these other countries are outperforming is they don't have that narrow leadership that we have here. They are not so heavily concentrated in technology or communications or things like that. They have broader industry exposure. And as I said, there's growth opportunities in a lot of different industries right now. So you're not just diversifying geographically, you're diversifying in terms of industries that you have exposure to Absolutely. when you invest uh, around Absolutely. the world. Absolutely. There's, there's plenty. I, I think people forget that when you go overseas, it's not just saying Europe. 
You could talk about Europe sectors. You could talk about Europe growth and value. Nobody ever does, but there's plenty of opportunities like that. And as you well know, in the so-called lost decade from, what, 2000 to 2010, yeah, the S&P went nowhere. But if you were yes. invested overseas, you, you did okay, right? Single digit exactly. returns. Exactly. I think people should think similarly to what the period you just described. Think of, this, think of the stock market as a seesaw, where the fulcrum of the seesaw may be the market. Yeah. And it doesn't do very much, but either end of the seesaw could be very exciting. So our point is the seesaw is tilted in one direction, the narrowness of the market you just described. So at one side of the seesaw, we have all the sexy stuff. The other side of the seesaw, we have virtually everything else in the world, and the seesaw <laughs> is going to adjust. Great analogy. Rich Bernstein, thanks so much for coming by. Thanks, Jack.